welcome to The Far Away Nearby, a show about two nerds and an intellectual sharing experience and laughs along the way. It's been a while since we've done a show. Um, we've had Madame Sue, who was unavailable for a while, and we are glad to have her back. Hello, Sue. Hi, DJ. How are you? I am much better than I was before. Well, that's good to hear, and uh, we'll be talking about what kept her from us, and we'll also be introducing someone new to the fold this week. Um, this is a longtime friend, so I'm sure that Sue and her will hit it off, um, ladies and gentlemen, and folks in between. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the lady Janet. Hi. Hi, Janet. How are you, all things considered? I am okay. Janet and I came to know each other through science fiction fandom. Um, I was in my teen year still. She and I ran across each other at a convention. I hadn't come out of the closet yet. Janet actually invited me to her winter ball, and my best way to get out of going was to tell her I wasn't sure how my boyfriend at the time would have felt. <laughs> um, I think that, I, if I remember right, you had something to say, too, when I, I said that, didn't you? Right. I, I think I said that you'd be a better dancer than most of the guys, and the nuns wouldn't have to worry about you. So, you know, why not? Come on down. Um, and you also had a really great bowl cut at the time. I really need to find that picture because, wow, hair. <laughs> <laughs> I could just imagine that. Oh, <laughs> well, sexy, let me tell you. oh well, I I was in the various stages of my hair. Then I was trying to grow it out, and I thought I don't want it long in the back and short in the front. This isn't a mullet, so I decided that rather than to you know go out and get that actual haircut, I was going to do it myself. So I cut my hair before school. <laughs> The bowl on your head? I don't even think I had a bowl. I just tried to cut a straight line myself. Oh, honey. You, you should have used the bowl. You tried to do something straight. That's, that's never good. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we've stayed friends over the years, and we've actually both been part of each other's weddings. So it's it's been, you know, one of those sweet stories. I thought in, in we needed somebody to to fill in and to uh, join our fold since life seemed to interrupt our original co-host. And I thought, who better than two of my longest friends? So uh, we now have Janet with us. Woo! And this is good. Yes. So we normally start our show with a section that we like to talk about called Peaks and Valleys. And it's basically... How our weeks went. So, does anyone want to volunteer about uh, to talk about how their week went? I've been gone for a while, and part of it was planned, and part of it was not. As you may recall, I had been talking about getting my uh, left shoulder replaced because it was a massive uh, pain from uh, uh, arthritis, yes. Mm -hmm which the doctors have all agreed I have gotten very young, and it's not the most pleasant thing when you can't move your arms or your knees. So I now have four joint replacements, two two shoulders and two knees. Oh, all so right. you're good for another 50,000 miles? I think so. <laughs> I think so, unless the hips give out for some reason. But there's no indication that that's going to happen. So the arthritis does not seem to have settled there. Well, that's good. So... I, I am good to go. Mm -hmm. It's just that the the first three, the shoulder and the two knees were done by one doctor at one hospital that I really liked. But when I went back to him and said, it's time to do this other shoulder, I can't hardly move, um, I'm in constant pain, he said, I don't do shoulders anymore, but I have a couple of partners that do shoulders. And I kind of screwed up my face and said, well, I talked to them. And he says, well, if you really want me to do it, I would, but I really am not comfortable because I'm so out of shape 
doing that. I went and talked to the other doctor. He seemed reasonable. A uh, bit of a hippie kid, but <laughs> but that's okay, you know? Mm-hmm. Feels like home. <laughs> the first, it does. The first doctor looked like a child when I met him, so what the heck? Oh, Doogie Hauser. <laughs> it, it was really. I just, I, it took me the longest time to figure out he was my doctor and not the, like, resident student. But he looks a little older now. <laughs> not a lot. So I went and talked to the doctor, and he seemed okay, and we set a date. which I went to the hospital, which is in the next city over, and I checked in at 5 o'clock, and at 7 o'clock, I'm out, and they're cutting out my shoulder, which is, well, fine. But I wake up in the recovery room, and you don't usually do that. In my past experience, I've been sort of groggy in the recovery room, and maybe I have seen the doctor, maybe not. So I sort of was, like, totally awake. I was, like, in the recovery room for three hours longer than I should have been, and that was kind of funky. But we have not only a new doctor, we have a new hospital because the hospital has been sold to another grouping. So I finally got to a room. I spent the night there, and they put this sling on my arm, which it had I left it there would have frozen my arm at a 90-degree angle, which I didn't think was a good idea because that had not happened to me the first time. It did happen to a friend of mine who had the same surgery at the time, And she had the most painful uh, physical therapy and recovery that I can think of. And I'm going, I'm not doing that one. (laughs) So when when I got home, which happened to have been less than, I don't know, 30 hours later, maybe 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 more than that. I'm not sure. I checked in at five o'clock in the morning. I was out of the hospital and on my way back to my house at noon the next day. And I thought that was a little funny. And then I got home and and I took the sling off because the sling was just killing me. And I took the meds that they sent me with and went to sleep, (laughs) which was not unusual because when I had my first, the surgery on the first shoulder, I slept for, I I was in the hospital for four days and I slept most of that time, which was a good thing. I I thought, you know, you sleep through the pain and that's a good thing. Then my spouse had to go to work. He kind of got me up and told me I should kind of get ready. And we, not that I was going anywhere, but that I needed to take my medicine and, and things like that. And I, had taken medicine. I had been taking medicine at every four hours or, or thereabouts because that's what the pres- that's what the prescription said: take every four hours for pain. And so I was. Well, I went into the bathroom, and twenty minutes later, I'm still in the bathroom. So he comes in and suggests that maybe I ought to go back and lay down in bed or something. He hands me toilet paper, and I proceed to wipe my face. And then my grandchild, who has come over to stay with me just to make sure that I'm okay, suggests that I ought to stand up and I proceed to try and walk up the wall. My spousal unit decides to call 911 because that's what you with crazy people who are drugged out of their minds, right? Mm. <laughs> Which appears to have been what, what had happened. And they got me to the hospital about 5 o'clock that evening and My husband and my daughter took off work because they were both a little uncertain about what was going on with me, and I don't remember a thing. (laughs) This was all told to me. Alice went down the rabbit hole. Apparently. (laughs) Yes. So I ended up staying in the hospital about six blocks from my home for Two weeks, and that's the first part of my ordeal, and we can stop there for a while. I got better eventually. (laughs) Well, I think the most ironic part about that is I remember when you were released thinking, that seemed to be relatively short, but of course nowadays hospitals try to free up those beds as quick as they can. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Janet, I, I specifically texted her, and I was like, so are you being left home alone, but you know, uh, all by yourself with the meds? Are you being trusted with the meds? And she kind of laughed it off. And I'm just thinking, oh, no, I haven't heard from her. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, uh, my, my, um, my concerns had some foundation there. So. Uh, well, my husband counted the meds later and he discovered that I took less meds than I was supposed to have. 
mm-hmm. during that time. So I'm glad that I took less meds. Did somebody mess up the dose or something? No, I called the doctor. At some point, I called the doctor or the doctor's nurse or somebody and asked them about the prescription because, A, it wasn't helping me, and, B, it did seem to make me kind of woozy. And the medications I'd had before, all the medications from the ones I'd had before and the ones I had now were hydrocodone or uh, hydrocodone or hydro whatever. It was one of the, those. Yeah, like Vicodin. You know, that they're trying to get everybody off of because the to heroin, basically, yeah. They're now having overdoses with this stuff. And so you can happens. give them to children, but you can't give children medical marijuana. And that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, um, it's true. But the, but the thing is that they that they don't want you to... It's sort of like when when the people in the inner cities were, use, were overdosing on these drugs, we put them in jail. Right. When the white people in the suburbs started overdosing on these things, we started to say, oh, well... We can't. Oh, have, we yes. need to. We need to do something about this. We need to to, to bring these doses down, and we need to uh, that kind of stuff. My mother had a real bad day. It, of it's kind morphine. of that way, but but uh, I went to. I I can't believe it. I had the fire department out in my hallway of my apartment complex working on me like a drug addict. Because I overdosed on these drugs and didn't even realize that was a possibility. Because when I had the first three surgeries, the doctor sent me home with a 12-hour slow-release hydrocodone and a short-term every four hour if you need it hydrocon or whatever. Or I, I I don't know the exact. Maybe names. you're just extra sensitive to it, also. Well, and when I was when I when I got over it, when the pain went away. And I was through with physical therapy. I packed all the stuff in a little bag and took it to my pharmacy, and they did whatever they do with it. Yeah. Okay? I mean, that's yeah. what you do with drugs. Uh, it, when you have up drugs that you aren't using anymore, you take them <laughs> to the pharmacy, and you don't laugh. <laughs> Unless you're my family, <laughs> and that's the story for another time. <laughs> they get rid of them, right? Um, well, sometimes you keep them in your medicine cabinet until they get scary, like my mom does. Well, yes, you can do that, too. I, she it, had chloroseptic in a glass bottle. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Ooh, is that the family heirloom? Uh, this stuff had these expiry dates on it, like the pills were just kind of disintegrating. Oh, oh, she's real bad about drugs, <laughs> keeping old drugs. And, like, she used to be the neighborhood, you know, trafficker, not in oxys, but in, like, oh, you take this diabetic, man. Well, this person isn't on that anymore, so they can have yours. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But, oh. Well, that's been, that's been something going on in the... In, in the suburbs and other burbs, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. it, it, around around the country for a long time where people exchange drugs. And the doctors always tell you, don't do that. But everybody is, is still uh, is still doing OK. My, my mm-hmm. mother had a, an OD episode in the hospital where they were giving her morphine like crazy. And <laughs> um, she like bitch slapped a nurse and was cussing out my father. It was crazy. I was not there. Um, yeah. but and they gave her one time they gave her dilaudid so much dilaudid that she was seeing like hallucinating and stuff um, wow yeah I um she has also two shoulders she has two shoulders and one knee and mm-hmm. eventually the knee is gonna the other knee is gonna need to be done but yeah and she also has four spinal fusions so she's talking about Ooh. Uh, another a new doctor has come up with this S one vertebra problem mm-hmm. that you can be corrected with like a quick surgery, and uh, she just got an MRI and might be getting. Oh, it's so quick! It's outpatient. I'm like, ma, it's spinal surgery. And she's <laughs> yeah. like, oh, it's laser and all this shit. I'm like, okay. Um, it's so just a trip to the convenience it. store. It's her her back is bothering her again, but. Hopefully this this might be a thing, but she's 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 like the bionic woman also. So I, yeah, I get well, it. I, I I I would not trade my my new knees and shoulders for anything. I I mean it's just it's amazing. Even the shoulder that it has just been done mm-hmm. that it still hurts a little and hasn't been through physical therapy yet. It feels so much better than it did on the 29th of March. 
Well, we'll be expecting you to be giving <laughs> tennis lessons by summer, Missy. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, I, ex- I expect to be able to reach the top shelves of my cupboards with both of my arms by the end of summer. <laughs> Do they give people new elbows? Pardon? Do they give people new elbows? I wonder I this stuff. I think they may. I'm not real sure. I Elbows <laughs> are not something I've had a problem with yet. <laughs> Things that make you go, hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they can replace almost any joint, I understand. For me, I think probably the high point of my week was my husband decided that he was going to get me a new smartwatch. Now, um, I say a new smartwatch as if I I had another. I, I sort of kind of did. He gave me one for my birthday. It was kind of an off-brand. We knew that it probably wasn't the highest quality. It was kind of a starter smartwatch in yeah. that, you know, I would get used to the idea of having one and see how it worked out and if I liked it. And it's odd because I think it may have had more features than the one I have now, but of, of course, it kind of kicked the bucket after hmm, about a month and a half. The mm. um, the only way to sort of wake up that watch was by hitting the you know the the um, the the little winder part, the stem, mm-hmm. and of course, all of the complaints about this watch were that that stopped working so how do you get a watch to respond if the only way to wake it up stops working Uh, Uh, (laughs) that sounds kind of uh, downhill or something i mean it doesn't doesn't seem to work so fortunately we knew that it was kind of an off brand and we didn't cry a whole lot because you know it was a starter watch and um, i was debating on what my replacement was going to be Uh, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of money. And one of the things that I knew, of course, was, you know, being as Apple is high quality, that it was a little out of my league in price wise. But um, I didn't all I also didn't want to get its counterpart, the Samsung watch, because they were both sort of pricey. Mm -hmm. So so I did some research and I decided, you know, I, I needed to know what I basically wanted it to do. And I've been on sort of a health craze of late where I joined a gym back in December. Mm-hmm. And I wanted it to be able to, you know, tell me simple things like my calorie count for the day and my blood pressure. Well, apparently that's also one of the things that makes a watch expensive is the <laughs> sensors on it. And, yeah. you know, and the quality of that. So anyways, I ended up coming home from work one day last week and it had been the day that he was off and he had gone and got me a watch that I had been looking at. So I have this great watch that I got was a, a Fitbit blaze. Basically it's Fitbit's first smartwatch. Oh yeah. And I really like it. In fact, while it is just basically kind of a fitness tracking device, it does also give me like text, a text message alert. So if I get a text message, it will start to read it out on the face of my watch. Um, but to, it's it's great because if I wear this to bed, it will actually measure my hours of sleep. So I can get a report and look back and see this week I'm averaging, you know, five and a half or six and a half hours of sleep. Maybe I should try to get to bed earlier. So uh, that was the high point of my week was getting this new fitness watch, and well, that, it, it sounds like a good deal. Yeah, and I was, I, I it was, uh, I was very pleased to learn that on our days off together, when we're going out and about running errands, and he's has me running all over in stores. Uh-huh. That if I end up having to skip the gym that day, I am still making progress because it counts my steps. Yeah. So, um, the so the uh, that's the high point of my week. Now, the low point of my week, unfortunately, it's it is often work, and you know that's life. We all have to vent a little bit, right? Um, at work, the candy shop. Well, on 
Friday, I um, I was a little bit late leaving, and recently, uh, this last month here, I started working on an earlier shift, and this is sort of in preparation. I, I wanted to get used to working earlier hours so that in the near future, if we get around to actually adopting, that I, I might be in a better position to come home and spend time with the kids. So, right. um, anyways, I was getting ready to leave work on Friday, and as I've mentioned in a past show, the candy shop has um, had a, a, a venture recently where we've bought some territory from a competitor and we've expanded. Well, I ended up on a lengthy call on Friday that took me a half an hour over my shift, and I was not pleased. I ended up having to call another of our offices, and it was one of these in one of the new territories. Right. And the person that I talked to there was a little less than helpful. They basically Uh said... I don't know how to handle one of these orders. I don't know if we do these here. And I was just like, oh, can I talk to your supervisor, please? Because this is supposed to be who I call for help with these things, and you're not being helpful. (laughs) So after being stuck on a call for a half an hour beyond my shift, I was in no mood to go to the gym and on my way out, I stopped by the break room and I picked up a cheeseburger. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I may or may not have counted that on my calories for the day, but I, I did not have a second dinner after that. So. <laughs> well, well, that was a good thing. <laughs> I, I used to get caught up into these things where I would have eaten at home and then somebody decides that we should go out. Mm hmm. And because I didn't know what else to do, I would sit there and eat because it's really a bummer to sit in, around a table with a bunch of people and, and they're eating and you're not. Mm-hmm. Or at least I think yep. it is. Oh, yeah. So, Janet, um, did you want to go ahead and talk about your week? Uh, we basically usually talk about the best part of our week and the and the worst part and you can tame it if you want to. <laughs> well, this I don't think there was the, the I don't know if this week had a best part. I mean, it had a pretty bad part because our 20-year-old kitty cat passed away in my arms and he is my soul kitty. He was um he it was about a, the end of a month long decline that started in the early part of March. He needed emergency surgery and then he had lost so much weight but he was happy like up until the very last day when he was hiding from us i knew it was the end but he was like extra affectionate he would sleep on top of me (laughs) instead of just next to me he was always on us like getting his last little bits of love in on this on this plane and he passed wednesday night in my arms he was all curled up in an electric blanket while we were watching TV, so he was warm and he was safe, and that's kind of the best way to go, surrounded by your loved ones. But <laughs> And since Wednesday night, I have been intoxicated or sleeping most of the time because I just can't handle reality right this minute. So we've decided to put me live on the internet. <laughs> Yay! We're actually recorded on the internet, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're in good company though, because we have lots of people. I'm what? I was just saying that you're in good company though, because I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that listen to us that can appreciate what you're going through. My daughter and her family are going to have to put put their 17 year old pug down. Uh, she is in massive pain, and there's not anything else they can do for her. Yeah, and I was going to have to call. Have to at home, they have at home euthanasia around here, which is more comfortable for everybody, especially with a cat, because the cats hate cars. At least mine did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to call them the next morning, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I had a dog that was 17. He was a bigger dog. Little yeah, well, dog, this, longer. Yeah, this little pug is 
she's she's had kind of a, a, a bit of a rough life and and uh the past few years she's integrated a number of other animals into her life and I don't think she's very happy about that. <laughs> mm-hmm. She was an only dog for a while and not much of her life. I mean she had they had several pugs all the time. She was alive mostly, but there was a little while she got to be an only dog, and I think she liked that a lot. Yes, um, Jan, I don't know if you were aware that I had a dog for a while in Colorado. Um, no. I, when my ex and I uh, were living together, we had a long-haired dachshund that he had brought home. Oh, yeah, Ruby. Yeah. Um, I had her until after I moved back and... Um, my other half, we'll call him Billy because he's a doll. Um, Billy and I were moving in together and we had had all of our things collected in my little one bedroom apartment, which is my first and only apartment here since moving back. We were on the evening of moving in together the next day and my little 13 year old dachshund had decided that it was too much for her that she wasn't going to make it to the next chapter. So she passed away the night that we were going to be moving in together. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, of course it was so emotional for me because I had grown up with such severe allergies that I was never allowed a pet. Uh, My ex brought this dog home from a, a road trip. She had belonged to a family member that wasn't able to keep her anymore. So he brought her home. Anyways, I kept her with me when we separated, and then I brought her home. Anyways, it was just kind of marking a chapter because uh, when we uh, when we took her to be laid to rest, my mom had given me these towels that had belonged to her her uh, second husband's first wife that had passed on. Uh huh. I, I, you know, it's one of those things where you get your first apartment and friends and family all want to give you some place to get settled. Yeah. Things. She gave me the towels that belonged to her husband's dead wife because they were hideous. They were pink and she wanted rid of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, of course, the car. you know, and who better to give your pink towels to than your gay son? Well, of course. And so, <laughs> try as I might to bleach them, I couldn't make them much lighter. But when my dear sweet Ruby passed away, we we gave her a princess send off. She was wrapped in pink towels, and my other half works for uh, retail, so he had these boxes that once held Gloria Vanderbilt jeans in them. So. <laughs> She, she she had a you know a royalty send off. She was wrapped in pink and was glow- going with Gloria Vanderbilt. I was so lucky to have friends and family there helping us move because I was pretty much worthless. Yeah, I imagine you were very fond of that dog. I was. I mean, she was. You know, she was a, a symbol of innocence of things to come you know she made the transition with me from having a house to being on my own mm-hmm. which, but most people do that in reverse <laughs> <laughs> and then you it's, just have uh, the cats right yes Billy's cats. yeah Billy uh, lived in the country before we met so of course he had not only one but three cats because that's what you do in the country <laughs> And it just made it ever so easy for us to find a place to live together. <laughs> um, so, those were our weeks. We can move into our weekly topics. I don't know if you had anything that you wanted to bring up, Sue. I have something that I could talk about briefly. There is this book I've been going to talk about mm-hmm. for a while now. And I'll, maybe I'd try it one more time. Sure. A few weeks ago, I finished a book called Lisbon, War in the Shadows of the City of Light, 1939-1945, and it is about Lisbon, uh, Portugal, during World War II. Um, Now, as you probably know, Portugal was not involved in World War II, nor was Spain. They managed to stay neutral, as did Switzerland, throughout the war. However, Lisbon was 
has this really nice, it's built on this really nice uh, port where everybody, both allies and the Axis powers, stopped in to do business. They both had embassies there running constantly throughout the war. And many of the people that were rescued out of Europe to England or the United States uh, went through the Lisbon port. Some of them stayed there. The uh, the recently uh, abdicated King of England was there for a while with his wife, um, which was a cause of his abdication. And um, it, there was a lot of intrigue. Not a lot of of killing and fighting, but a lot of intrigue and a lot of jousting back and forth and how to do this and that. And the then dictator, uh, whose name I don't remember right now, uh, of of Portugal, jockeying to keep Portugal out of war and out of the uh, the hands of either the Allies or the Axis powers, because he wasn't sure who was going to be the best for them. They were a small power. They didn't have a lot of army. They didn't have a lot of defense. He just wanted to get Portugal through the the war. And it it was a really interesting book. It's a view of World War II I haven't thought about, and I haven't really thought about Portugal in terms of World War II at all. <laughs> and I found it fascinating. And the book is by... I have that. Neil Lockery, a historian. So that's all I had to talk about. Billy and I have gotten into the habit that when we have Sunday off together, I usually will turn on the news as our way of waking up. CBS Sunday Morning has this wonderful quality to it where it's like an old-style news show. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they, they have old style TV studio sets, you know, they use kind of retro graphics to the different segments. And this week they interviewed Kathy Bates, act, uh, actress Kathy Bates, Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the Academy Award winner. And, um, it was quite interesting because the interview that they did with her, she discussed, uh, an illness that she suffers from that she may not be aware of. Now, in the past, she has been a cancer survivor. She has had a mastectomy, so she's survived breast cancer. But she's also afflicted with this illness called lymphedemia. And this was, of course, I, I don't keep my, you know, thumb on the pulse of medical news, but... Oh, DJ, um, why not? <laughs> yeah, um... But it was interesting to hear about because um, she allowed the cameras to accompany her on one of her doctor appointments. Lymphedemia is a condition where the body does not distribute the fluids properly. Uh, of course, your, your lymph system helps is part of your immune system and helps you fight off uh, illness and infection. And Mm -hmm. apparently when she had her mastectomy, part of that surgery also removed uh, many of her lymph nodes. So um, they were discussing lymphedemia as a condition where people who suffer from it actually get swelling in their joints and their limbs. And it's because the body is not basically, it's not regulating the distribution of your fluids. So people who suffer from this condition uh, have to go through these therapies where basically they massage the fluids back into the body to distribute them evenly. Hmm. So it's it's quite an interesting uh, thing because, you know, of course, there are certain things that happen to the human body, whether you're in shape or not, or possibly whether you're young or not. And, of course... You can only assume what a person's position or situation is in life on their appearance, and unfortunately, that's 
how we stereotype a lot of people is, you know, you're either overweight or you're old. And <laughs> it was interesting to see this because she took you on, you know, this medical procedure with her. and She wanted people to become aware of this condition known as lymphedemia. And apparently uh, some of the statistics that she mentioned with the, um, the the illness because I I believe she's also a spokesperson for a foundation um, of awareness on it is that the number of people who are affected by this condition actually outnumbers the amount of people who suffer from MS or HIV AIDS in this country. That would not surprise me because a lot of a lot of um, what they call orphan illnesses are not as orphaned as they seem. Mm-hmm that um, the idea of an orphan illness is one that has so few sufferers that it's not worth time or money to, to, to put for researching it. But uh, a lot of, I think, the orphan illnesses are really not that orphan. They are, um, it's just that nobody's interested in them, or they aren't that bad, or they aren't that dramatic. And so people don't get interested in them, but... But certainly, uh, there could be a lot of people suffering from them. And um, part of the interview that Kathy Bates gave CBS that kind of um, uh, put a, added a little humor to the situation was she was talking about having had her mastectomy, having survived breast cancer. She was talking about um, filming some scenes from some of her recent work, which was on FX American Horror Story. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. I'm I I'm not a regular watcher of that program, but my understanding is that it's been on for several seasons now, and she has been a regular on uh, some of those seasons. So she's played different characters, and mm-hmm. um, what was interesting was she was talking. Kathy Bates was talking about the particulars of the scene she was filming, and it was one where the camera was focusing on her hands on like a kitchen counter where she's kneading some dough or some bread or something. She's uh, kneading some bread or something on this counter. As they were trying to film the scene, the, uh, the director said to her, well, there, there's something that's getting in the way of the camera and I can't quite tell what it is. And they, they were trying to be polite to her. And, you know, mm-hmm. they ask her to look at the footage, and she's like, that's my breast. <laughs> and she says, that's what's in the way of the camera. She's like, I had a mastectomy. They're not real. If it's in the way, I could move it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's really hard sometimes for for anybody to talk about uh, a thing about body parts that are sexual. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps not if you were filming porn, but but in real life, I mean, you don't want to say, you know, hey, your boobs in the way there, lady, right? Uh, <laughs> especially to a, a, an actress that has been at least nominated for an Academy, if not one more. Mm. You know, you you just don't want to say things like that, right? But, but what do you say? Out in the far And that's all the time we have for this episode. We hope you'll join us next time when we bring the far away nearby. Thank you for listening to the far away nearby. You can find our fan page on Facebook. Our email is tfnpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at tfndj. Or leave us a message at 720-230-6919. This show is part of the Pride 48 Network. Find more shows over at pride48.com.